Okay, well hi Dorian, thank you very much for making the time to uh, be interviewed by me. Thank you Nick, and I think uh, it's appropriate that we're doing it here in Temple Gym because this has been like a massive part of the, the story I think, so good that we're doing it in, in this building. Yeah, well before I go into asking you a few questions about the gym and how you actually got to the position you're in now, I actually want to say a big thank you, and I've never actually had the opportunity to thank you on camera. Uh, what most people don't realise is that when I first started Body Power, uh, back in, uh, well, we started working on 2008, Correct. Uh, I uh, approached a lot of people uh, to try and get support for the show and uh, was told by most people that it wouldn't work and uh, they weren't very keen to support it. But uh, you'll probably remember we had a meeting um, over the road, I think it was at a coffee yeah. shop, and uh, you're the only person that actually said, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, I'll put I did say it. I did say it was a good idea, but to be honest, I did think it would take a lot longer than it did to reach the uh, success that it did. Almost from the first year, it was. Uh, I mean, it was a success, and it just grew and grew. Um, so I, I've got to admit, I was taken aback a little bit how successful it was. Um, but I think it's because uh, the people, your team that do body power, a professional team. That's what they do, they put on expos and they're working on it all year round. Whereas before, somebody that's tried to put on a contest or an expo, it's probably somebody that's kind of doing it as a sideline, the part time, they've got another business or something, they're doing it because they're interested in it and they're passionate about it. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort people, to make it successful. Most people think that those shows, like Body Power, have been around for a long time. But of course, when we did it, remember there was, there was nothing then. There was nothing. And I mean, it's amazing. So I say this at Body Power every year, and I said I'm amazed that I'm here and all these people are here in Birmingham. Because I remember when I started training, I mean, to think that you would have an international expo, bodybuilding and fitness in Birmingham was, was pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you remember you said um, you could get a big name bodybuilder over. Obviously, we've got yourself supporting the show, but we wanted somebody else. And you got Victor Martinez, I think, to agree, uh, which I don't think anyone else would have been able to do for a show that had never run before. And then I think it was about a week before the show, he got an injury and he yeah, couldn't come over. Yeah, for some reason he couldn't get over, yeah. And you said, you said, well, don't worry, I'm going to find somebody else. And then you came back to me and said, uh, look, I found somebody. He's not very well known, but I think he's going to be big. And that man was Kai Green. Yeah. So uh, you, uh, you spotted a good one there. Yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw Kai years ago in New York when he was... He was competing as a natural and he was very good. So when he started competing in the pro ranks, and I could see the guy was very uh, dedicated and is very entertaining uh, poser and yeah. as well, very unusual. So yeah, it was good that we got him. Yeah, well, anyway, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. And um, so to today's interview, what I wanted to do was really focus on your early years. Um, there's lots of footage of you doing interviews on uh, your later years when you've won, you've, uh, you've reached success. but. I'm personally very interested, I know there's a huge number of people that are interested in finding out just what it takes to become Mr. Olympia and the sort of mindset and your upbringing in childhood. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I, I want to talk about that, but before I do, I've got a question which is um, uh, really uh, not being answered as far as I know, uh, which is about your name. Uh, so your yeah. name is Dorian Andrew... Minkers yes. Yates, I believe that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, I used to think it was Manchus when I was a kid because that's how it's spelt. Um, and I didn't really know that, that much about my family's background on my mum's side because that's where the, the name comes from. And I asked my mum, you know, what's this come from? Where's the ethnic background? And she didn't really know apart from the fact that some of the family were in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> but my mum passed away in 94, and her maiden name is Rissick. And apparently there's only one surviving person in the UK with the name Rissick, and he's a relative, and he, he came to the funeral. And he said, I thought you might be interested in this. And he gave me a family tree that goes back to 1700 huh. from my mum's side. So they were, Rissick were a German family that married into a Dutch family that had the name Meinkes, or Meinkes, whatever it is. And uh, they went to South Africa, so I guess they were Afrikaans. And that name was passed down to me, and I passed it down to my daughter. Mm -hmm. I think it means 
well, at least I was told by an Afrikaans that it means basket or something. So. Basket? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think so. I thought you were going to uh, say warrior or something like yeah, that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a very unusual name, but the origins are Dutch. So my mum was, her background ethnically was German Dutch, and my dad was a Brummie, so he was English. And um, you're, when you were born in a, uh, on a farm, is that right? No, I was actually born in Solihull. My dad was a maintenance engineer at uh, the Rover plant there. Wow. And uh, my mum and dad, I guess, I'm not sure quite how they met, but they came from very different backgrounds. My dad was a working class Birmingham guy. My mum was uh, privately educated from Uppingham in Rutland, and both of her parents were teachers at private schools. So was uh, both from totally different backgrounds. And my mum was a horse rider, that's what she did. And yeah. I think my dad was doing some work at the riding stables or something, and that's how they met, and I think I was a result of that <laughs> <laughs> meeting. Uh, so um, your mum w gave horse riding lessons, did she? Yeah, my mum was a horse riding fanatic. Uh, so we lived in Solly Hall until I was four years old, and my dad being, I guess, an ambitious person wanted to, you know, change his life. He, went, he bought a little small holding in uh, Hurley, which is near Kingsbury in Warwickshire. Yeah. And I think their idea was to have a uh, well, chicken farm for eggs and stuff like that. But I guess it didn't work out. So in the end, my mum was running kind of a little, nothing official, no health and safety, no helmets, nothing like that. Little riding school to make, help ends meet, I guess. Uh, we had a couple of horses. And interestingly, I had my own pony, and his name was Shadow, which right. is strange because later on, I yeah. was nicknamed the Shadow. So yeah, that's spooky. Little coincidence, yeah. Yeah. So um, your dad worked for Rover, and what, what position was he there? He was a maintenance engineer. Because that's quite strange that someone would basically go and buy a small holding and move out. But to he the still side. he still worked at the Rover as well. I guess he was trying oh, to see, you know right. transition out of one into the other. I don't really know because I'm so young, but what I, can, what I can figure out, that's what he wanted to do. You sound um, like a hard working man. He was a hard working guy. He worked all, he worked night shifts. So he worked on the night shifts and in the daytime he flew uh, light aircraft. That was his hobby. Um, but I didn't really see that much of him, to be honest. We weren't really like a family unit. Uh, I think my mum and dad got together because of me and it was the 60s, but the feeling I got is they led separate lives, almost. Uh, so that my old man wasn't around that much. So, he, so you didn't see much of him? I did see him, but he worked nights, and in the daytime he was fixing cars or flying airplanes. He seemed to sleep about two hours a day. Um, so I saw a little of him, but we were never like a family unit, like let's go to dinner as a family, or let's go on holiday, or let's do something as a family. That, well, that did that happen right when you were small, or did that? That, that was always the case, yeah. Okay. And um, your dad passed away when you were 13, uh, 13 yeah. And can you remember that? Yeah, of course I can remember it. I mean, 13, you're just developing, you're just you know, becoming a man, getting to puberty and everything. So. It's a very traumatic event to happen at, at that age, I think, so you're not going to forget it. Um, he died of a heart attack, and I mean, now it's not surprising the, the kind of lifestyles that people led then, you know, um, not getting any sleep, 40 cigarettes a day, alcohol, you know, people didn't know about anything. That was that was fairly normal, kind of macho yeah. male attitude of the, the 70s. Yeah. So my old man passed away when I was 13. Um, and my mum met another guy, I guess from the same works or something, uh, who lived in Birmingham, and they decided they wanted to live together, and uh, we're all going to move to Birmingham, which I was not happy about too much, as it was quite recent after my father's death. So I really don't want to come here to Birmingham and leave my friends and everything I was familiar with. Um, but, you know, that's, that's destiny. If I hadn't come to Birmingham, I might never have gone into a gym, and maybe we're not sitting here now. So when you, know? you first came to Birmingham, what was it like? Uh, well, I came to Birmingham, I lived in Castle Bromwich, um, which is a bit of a change from my school. Um, although I lived outside Birmingham, um, I think the school I was from was a bit more rough and ready. Uh, I lived in an area where there was a lot of collieries, so the families were, you know, mining families, yeah. um, mostly from Scotland and up north, Newcastle and so on. So. I think the school I was at was a bit tougher than the ones I came 
in Castle Bromwich. And I didn't really feel like I fitted in there too good until I met some guys that also moved from outside and moved and joined the school. So the last, the last year uh, at school was okay. I made some good friends and everything, but um, I didn't really feel very comfortable there. You know? Were you uh, academic? or? Uh, not particularly. I think I was quite good at school. Uh, for instance, I wanted to stop top students in history, but to be honest, I didn't really have any interest in pursuing it. I didn't, I didn't see the point. I still don't. I just think they're preparing you for a nine to five. Um, so I wasn't really motivated at school to do that well. Um, perhaps as well because not having a, you know, losing my dad and everything. I don't think I was in a, a very good mood. Uh, a lot of the teachers tried to talk to me, but I was just basically kind of disinterested. Um, and I didn't take my exams. I just left school without taking any exams. Um, but if I'm interested in something, I have the ability to absorb a tremendous amount of information. If I'm really, if I'm interested and motivated, and that's what I did with bodybuilding, um, everything, all the knowledge I gained was from reading, um, which really helped me because I didn't listen to other people in the gym, mm. even though I, they may have been more experienced than me and, and uh, so on. I didn't listen. I just absorbed the information and made my own decisions. I always had an ability to do that, even though. You know, as I said, there might be people that have been doing it a lot longer than me. I pretty much forged my own path, and I tend to do that in everything I do. Do you think you got that from your roots, or is that just the way you were? Um, possibly. I mean, I left uh, when I was 16 and I left school. My mum decided she didn't want to live in Birmingham because, tragically, uh, the guy that she was planning to marry, he passed away as well. I mean, for my mum, very tragic, I guess. My dad died. A year later, a new partner died from the same thing, from a heart attack. Which, you know, not uh, coincidentally, both of them were heavy smokers, which wasn't unusual back in the 70s. You know, people didn't really realise the dangers, I guess. Uh, but anyway, my mum is. Uh, she came to Birmingham to to marry somebody because she was in love, I guess. But she's not a city person. She wasn't comfortable here after he passed away. So when I left school, she wanted to move back, and it was either I moved with her back to, you know back out of the city, which now I'd become accustomed to, or I make my own way. So I decided to make my own way. I left home at 16 and uh, went to live at a friend's house and you know, eventually got my own. So I had to mm. make my own way. It wasn't like I had a choice. Either you're going to make your own way or you're going to mess up. You know, you're going to be out on the street. What are you going to do? You sound like you were very, very headstrong, like nobody could tell you what to do. Um, well, I didn't really have any support. so. I felt like I had to do my own thing. So maybe that, you know, sink or swim made me uh, strong and independent. Do you think then your father passing away at a young age affected you from that point? Well, I'm sure it has a massive effect. You know, I remember my dad used to, we had some old beat up cars and I used to drive around the field. I was, I was learning to drive at 12 years old. My dad was teaching me to drive at 12 years old. I didn't pass my driving test till I was 26. Um, for, you know, maybe, maybe one of the reasons. If I'd have had a nice, comfortable, stable family background, I don't think I'd be sitting here now because um, you need some kind of extreme hunger, drive to put yourself through all that, um, you know, uh, missing out on things, uh, through the diet, through the training, with very little support. You need focus for that. Mm. So I guess that's where that came from, you know, um, not having. Basically, I had to build something in life for myself. There was nothing there. I had no family to support me, nothing, you know, nothing passed down to me. I, I was on my own. So that makes you strong or you know, make you or break you, basically. Were you happy as a teenager then? Uh, I don't think so. Not after my dad passed away. I mean, that's a huge traumatic thing. Before that, um, you know, I lived on a little small holding. I had geese, uh, we had chickens, we had dogs, we had ponies. It's quite an idyllic kind of lifestyle, mm -hmm. really. All my mates wanted to come around to play in the barns because we could jump in the hay and mess about and stuff like that. So it was a good childhood for a kid, and then one day that all stopped, you know. Mm. And can you explain to us a little bit about your teenage years then? You moved to Birmingham, you were 16, you were on your own. Well, I, I moved to Birmingham at 13, so uh, we were living in Castle Bromish till I was 16, so my mum decided to, you know, she was going to leave Birmingham, what do I want to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to stay here now. You know, now I've made roots, I've made friends and everything. Um, so first of all, I went to live at a friend's house 
for about a year until he got fed up with it and I got fed up with it and what have you. And uh, then I got a small bed sit in Edgbaston, uh, which consisted of one room, one single bed, one chair, and one gas ring, and a bathroom that you share with eight people upstairs. So when you come from those kind of circumstances, you know, the hardship in the gym and, and the, the dieting and all that, is, it's really no big deal, you know? It, you, that's called motivation. How you've did got you, nothing like that. You had to rent that room. Presumably. Had to rent that. Yeah, I was working various jobs. Uh, one of them, I did some work on building sites, and then I got a job in uh, through a friend of mine in a slaughterhouse over Castle Bromwich, which kind of suited me because it might seem strange that I came from a farming background and now you're in somewhere where they're killing animals. But I think when you grow up on, on that kind of background, you're very practical as well. So it didn't really. Uh, troubling me too much and there was virtually, you know, the only rule we had at work is you can't fight on the shop floor. Be on time and don't fight on the shop floor. That was the only rule, so that suited me very well because I don't particularly like people telling me what to do in rules and I never did. Um, and if you don't, you have to forge your own way in life, otherwise you're always going to be working for somebody else. So that was a motivation as well. And uh, how long were you in the slaughterhouse for? I uh, worked there for about uh, a year and a half until somebody decided to set the changing rooms on fire and they just fired the whole shift. So yeah. I lost my job there. Okay. I wasn't responsible for the fire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't know. There's some crazy people working there. I don't know what was going on. And then what, what, what happened then then? So you had to find another job? Yeah, I was looking for another job and uh, one night I was with a friend. We were getting drunk, 18 years old. Uh, over in Castle Brom, and we heard about a party in Edgbaston. So we tried to catch the bus into town. We have to walk across town and catch another bus over to Edgbaston. So that's what we're planning to do. And we totally uh, passed us by that that day was rioting everywhere in Handsworth, in the city centre, you know, in London, in Brixton, in, uh, in Bristol. The whole country was in flames and the shops were getting looted and it kind of like we didn't really think about it until we went into town and we're walking through a town and it's, it's abandoned and all the shop windows are smashed out and everything and being drunk my mate thought it would be a good idea to pull this dummy out of the window and grab the jacket and the hat or something and wear it to the party, I don't know what he's thinking anyway. So he pulls it out but as he pulled it out all the plate glass that was left fell on the floor and within about 10 seconds there was about 20 police on top of us took us to the cells and basically the policy of the courts was that anyone that was arrested on that day on the street for whatever reason you're just going to get six months and that's it so um, that's what happened they gave us six months in detention center um, I actually appealed against it because I didn't want to say well I didn't do it my mate did it so obviously we went together but afterwards I appealed went back to court and got it reduced a little bit um, so I did three months in a detention centre, um, which I don't think they have anymore, but the idea was, they used to call it the short, sharp shock. Mm. So young offenders, they used to send them to these places and it's basically like militarised. So you have to get up in the morning and march the square and march everywhere and wear ties and in the daytime you do, supposed to be learning a trade. So I was doing plastering in the daytime, learning how to plaster. And uh, the other things they did in there were a lot of physical activities. And the first time we got there was circuit training. So um, it was about 20 stations in the gym, you know, pull-ups, sit-ups, jumps. Uh, they had some weights, squats, this, you know, so they were like a circuit. And the first time we went in there, it was like, right, you little bastards. You all go everything three times around. When you finish, you sit down here. And don't sit down here till you finish. So I went three times and I sat down. He was like, boy, what are you doing? Finished three times around. Went around there a fucking game. You didn't see, I didn't see you go around. So I went around again and sat down. And um, then they had powerlifting in there. Uh, we could do twice a week. And I think all the, the prison officers seemed to give me, treat me differently from the other guys because I was physically stronger. Plus, I did behave myself in there, you know, and I was a good influence on the other kids around me because some of the guys in there they're just unfortunate you know mm. they, they didn't have a, um, any family some of them had mental problems all kind of reasons that people in there 
Um, but because I was good in the gym, and because I was a positive influence on the other lads, I got treated. Um, uh, well, I think we had different ties, different colour ties. So the more colour ties you get, the more privileges you get. I've got the top tie within like a couple of weeks. I think they're like right, um, you know. So uh, I was treated differently in there because I was good with the weights. And the prison officer in there said to me, Yates, when you get out, you're going to go here, go to this, see this guy in Ernerton. He's got a powerlifting gym. You know, you should pursue this. But I wasn't interested in powerlifting. I was already interested in bodybuilding because I had been down in this building, in this gym, when I was at school. I was 16 years old. I was doing karate. And me and my mates, we came down here and we found Temple Gym, which at that time was the small little room over the other side that became the leg room when I took over it. But that was the gym then, just some weights. Some old benches with masking tape on it, some old rusty weights and a squat rack. And this whole side in here was a uh, Lao Gar Kung Fu. It was a Kung Fu center. Yeah. So it was just a little room in there with weights. And me and my mate started doing some weights in there. And there was a, there was a little shop just off New Street. And they had some bodybuilding magazines in there from America, Joe Weeders. Muscle builder, and it was like on the back shelf with the zipper and all the homo magazines on the back shelf. So you had to go and ask for it, like we, we can't yeah, on the back shelf there. Uh, and uh, my mate, who who happened to be black, I mean, and then we read this. We bought one of these magazines, and we seen Robbie Robinson in there. Robbie Robinson with his ripped up T-shirt and his dreadlocks and everything. And he was training with a white guy whose name was Denny. So Robbie and Denny, there used to be this thing, they used to train together and it's just home training together. And so me and my mate were like, yeah, well, you're Robbie because you're white. And, I, and I, you know, so we were, we were Robbie and Denny in the gym for six months. And then, you know, we left school and reality hit and weren't able to come back. But I always had that in my mind that I really enjoyed that and I seemed to be doing good at it straight away. And I preferred it much more than the karate that I was doing that was, I found it quite boring. So. The seed was there, and then when I went to the detention centre, I was showed, look, there's 300 guys in here. You're stronger than all of them. You've got a better physique than all of them. That's, three, that's a one in 300. Hey, well, maybe I've got something. Plus, I was in there with guys, and they were told by the people in there, and the officers are in there, listen, you do realise, unless you change your fucking ways, you're going to be in and out of these institutions all your life. And their response was, well, I don't give a fuck, but I did. So there was a difference there. I didn't ever want to go back there again, you know. And uh, more motivation, you know. So, do you think then that the detention centre actually changed you, or do you think it was always something that you were? No, li to listen. Do? I'm me, and what's inside me is inside me. Uh, the detention centre just like gave me a, a spark. Like, hey, now is the time to do something. Otherwise, you. You know, you've got two roads here. Which one do you want to go down to? And it was very clear to me. I didn't want to down that one, so mm. go down this one. And thank God I had something to work with, you know. I had so some kind of talent. You left the detention centre, and what did you do then? I left the detention centre with, you know, full intentions of, yes, this is what I'd want to do. I want to train, and I want to make this into something. It's something positive, and I think it can help my life. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to go somewhere positive. It's something to put my energy into that's positive, and I really want to do it. And I want to do it, and I want to compete. It wasn't like I want to go. I was already in the detention centre, bigger and stronger than most of the guys in there. I wasn't doing it because, hey, I feel inferior, I feel weak, I need to build myself up, which is the majority of people who start weight training is from that. The motivation is coming from that angle. My motivation is... I enjoy this and I think I can be bloody good at it, so I'm going to give it my best shot and I haven't got anything else. People, you know, it's a wise advice, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If I had one egg, one basket, so I'm looking after that egg, you know. And can you explain to us what you did then to... So I came out from the detention centre and first of all I knew if I want to train and I want to train properly and I want to eat and everything, I need stability. I need somewhere to live and I need a job. Those are my first priorities before I think about going to the gym because otherwise I'd just be wasting my time. So I'm very systematic when I want to do something, like plan it out properly. Um, so I managed to get a job. First job I had, I guess maybe thought that he owed me something, was through the father of the other guy that I went to jail with that I didn't say anything about, you know. So when I got out, I got a job with him 
and he worked on an industrial cleaning gang. So uh, they used to go into a factory, factories. The one I worked at was GKN Axles in Aston. So they make car parts, you know. So it's a dirty, filthy factory full of uh, swarf and oil and all this stuff are coming off the lathes and it's all over, you know, you've got this big piles of swarf and stuff you've got to shovel up and oil. So I went from the gym, gym in the morning, sweating and training, going to work, sweating and training and getting oil all over me and everything. Um, but I didn't care, it was giving me money which allowed me to do what I wanted to do, which was to train. So all my money at that point from the work went on buying some food, bus pass, and going to the gym. And that's it, all my mates were going out, doing the driving lessons, getting the cars, all you know, normal things that 21 years old did. Um, I'm not complaining at all, and I wasn't complaining then. I was just really happy to be doing what I wanted to do, and I didn't care about those did things you, at that time. Okay, but did you miss out on things, do you think? Um, probably at that time, but don't feel bad for me because I made up for it since then. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but had you got something in your mind then? Obviously, you wanted to train and get bigger. I wanted to train. Time. I wanted to compete, and uh, I had in my mind that one day I would like to be British champion, and maybe I can do that. That was from day one that I wanted to do that. Um, and I came to, t I was training at, uh, at that time it was called Martin's Gym. There's a guy called Martin owned it with not very much imagination, I guess. Um, so it was just that room in there again, was, uh, was Martin's Gym. When I started training, there was Martin's Gym. Uh, there was a gym in Hockley, which was a little gym as well, Weeder Gym. It was opened by somebody that had the Weeder shop. And the Weeder shop in Birmingham then was you know, that was great, that was, but it was the only place you could see anything about bodybuilding. As I said, when I was 16, I came here. If you wanted to find a bodybuilding magazine, it had to be on the back shelf of, you know, some place uh, very hard to get. Uh, so now we had this shop, we had a shop with all the supplements in, and they had a TV screen in there showing the Mr. Olympia and all that stuff. It was great. And they opened a little gym in Hockley, so I trained there as well. We had a gym, Martin's gym, trained Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays, and Tuesdays, I used to train at Newtown Community Centre, and I was the only white guy in there. But it was 50 pence to train on a, on a Thursday morning, so I used to go and train there. So those are the three gyms I was at. And uh, Martin was a photographer as well in his spare time. And he's seen me, I've been training, and think, we've got these pictures as well, so we can, we can put the pictures up for everyone to see. I think I'd been training about six months in the gym, but I already got uh, pretty good physique after six months and he said kind of take some pictures of you so good thing we did these things you know because so it's recorded what I looked like after six months of training and Martin said to me listen I'm putting a contest over the road at the Temple Hotel it used to be Temple Hotel across the road there uh, Mr. Birmingham our oh, big thing just for like local you know the gyms in Birmingham and everything Mr. Birmingham you should enter the novice contest and I was like oh no no not really for that yeah I don't want to do that yet and um, this was about two, three weeks before he was putting the thing on. No, I'm not going to do it. And then I got sick. I got the flu or something for about a week. And I couldn't eat properly. I couldn't train. But after a week, I looked myself in the mirror. I was like, hey. I was, already, I was very naturally lean always. I always had good abdominals, serratus, obliques. You could see them like, before I started training. And now I look shredded after one week of being sick. I thought, I'll have a go at this, you know. Um, so I remember I went to Boots and I bought some stuff called Sudden Tan. It's what ladies used to use, some mousse like to get tan, yeah? And trust me when I say my natural skin colour is white as that shirt. Wait till you see the pictures of me when I was training for six months. White as that shirt. And it was an ongoing problem I always had in bodybuilding. I couldn't get the colour right for stage. Even as a professional, I struggled with it. Anyway, got this stuff called Sudden Tan, which is a mousse you put on a sponge. And oh, look at this. I'm black. <laughs> Went on stage when I saw the pictures afterwards, and white well, as a milk bottle, you know. But <laughs> I thought I was black anyway. So um, went up there. There was one guy who was competing. He did the novice contest. I don't know why, because he was competing as a British level, and there was another lad quite good as well. Um, but apparently, I won quite easy. They told me so. Um, got my nice little trophy and everything. I was happy with that. 
And then I thought, well, I want to do the novice uh, British Championship. And, I, and I'd like to win the novice Britain. That's what I want to win. So to do that, I've got to qualify. So I choose a qualifier earlier in the year. Then I give myself a few months. If I qualify there, I can do the finals. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's what I plan to do. So this was about 18 months after I you know, started training properly. I went to, uh, and this time I did everything properly and I prepared for the contest properly. I dieted for 10 weeks and, uh, you know, uh, everything. And I did where everything did, myself. Where did you find out the information for that? I found out my information from reading. Uh, I'm a great reader. Even like, you could give me some nonsense to read and I'll just read it. Just because I find it relaxing to read. So I'm very good at absorbing information. And as I said, I'll read a newspaper, just some nonsense in there sometimes just to relax. So if it's interesting for me and absorbing I'll just absorb tons of information and then I had the confidence um, to make my own decisions based on that even though everyone in the gym was telling me I was doing everything wrong mm. you know and you'll never get anywhere oh, yeah, whatever I'm just going to do it my way thank you but how did you research if there was no internet then oh, of course there's no internet you've got these things called books yeah <laughs> and magazines words in there and I used to read them yeah, so I had tons of stuff. I had a nutritional almanac from the, from the library. Uh, I used to calculate my calories, count the grams of protein, carbohydrates, before everyone even knew what this was. I studied nutrition because it was relevant for me. I needed to study it. If they told me to study nutrition at school, I'd be like, ah, just off, I ain't studying that. But it was important to me then. I was interested. So if I'm interested, I could absorb all the information. So I spoke to nobody about it. I did my own diet, I did my own training, did everything myself, made my own decisions. Based on the information I was reading, I read a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I pretty much read everything I could get my hands on, but then it was like, you know, getting it down to what I think makes sense and then trying that, and if it works, or it didn't work. Why didn't you listen to other people? Like what, other people were willing to give you advice, presumably? Um, other people were willing to give advice, but I don't think it was from a point of really trying to help me, you know. Um, and there were no really like super experienced uh, people that I could talk to in, in Birmingham. There was a couple of guys that had competed in, in regional contests and everything, but there wasn't like anybody, you know, on a high level here that I could speak to. And as I said, there's no internet and so on. So the only source of information I've got is bodybuilding books, bodybuilding magazines, and then for the technical information, I bought nutritional uh, books and so on. Because I just wanted to set the scene by asking about internet, because obviously there's no email. Yeah, there's no email. Through my whole career, though, I think internet was just being kind of coming around, like, I don't know when the internet started, in 96, 97, I don't know. But anyway, I finished at 97, so there, were, there was no internet. And in some ways, it was better. I think the sport was a bit more romantic then. You know? But I was just thinking about finding out information, you know, all that nutritional information that you found yeah. from books, um, but you wouldn't have got uh, such a variety of different opinions as you would do now, for example. Well, you know, you've got the variety of opinions. You've just, people now, it's just, you get those opinions quicker, right? If you write today on the internet, I can read it today on the internet. Mm. But if you publish a book, it might be a year before I get it, but I still get the information. It's just the exchange of information is slower, that's all. Mm. There's not more or better information now, it's just quicker. In fact, there's a lot worse information now. Because if you want to write and publish a book, you must have something about you for somebody to want to publish it, unless you want to pay to publish your own book. But any twit can get on the internet and put their opinion. And most of them don't know what they're talking about. And, and uh, people are baffled because they're reading all these opinions. Well, I would ask you to see what this guy looks like who's giving this opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, because most of the times that people are giving opinions, they don't look very good themselves. So, you know, if you're a doctor, take your own medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but you, uh, rather than taking other people's advice, you were very much uh, finding out information for yourself. Finding out information for myself. And the thing that really appealed to bodybuilding, to me, because of the way that my life went, I didn't feel like the people that, when I was a kid, were responsible for me, did a very good job. So now mass, probably I can do a better job myself. That's what I was thinking. So maybe that makes me more independent thinking. You sound like you were very confident. Um, I'm a bit of a contradiction because I'm very confident and very strong and very determined. 
but I was also very kind of shy. I didn't like to be around a lot of people. And that's strange for a bodybuilder. I'm almost like the opposite of a typical bodybuilder. I don't like attention. I don't like people to looking at me. I don't like being on stage giving speeches. I don't like, I don't even like being on stage. It was just, I had to do that to show what I'd done in the gym. And you can ask anybody that was in this gym, you can ask my training partners, they never saw me. Even my training partner would never see me with a top off because I was not interested in their opinion. No disrespect, but I was not interested in their opinion because they're going to tell me I look great. Of course I do to them. Mm. But I'm not standing next to Lee Haney or whoever I was uh, aspiring to, to compete with and, and beat. So it wasn't very helpful for me. And, you know, walking around in a T-shirt or something and people on the street looking at me would just make me feel uncomfortable. I had no interest in that. Mm. Um, so that's unusual. Most people come into bodybuilding because they want to, hey, look at me. They're extrovert people. I'm an introvert. So uh, the thing that appealed to me was this is a total, you win, you lose, everything in bodybuilding is down to you. It's not a team sport, yeah? It's not, you're not playing a team sport and you think, oh, this guy let me down on the team, yeah? So that's what appealed to me. It was all about my efforts and what I did. And when I got on stage, if I messed up, I messed up, my responsibility. If I won, I won, my responsibility. And that's the way it's always been. And when you were learning stuff from the books, how did you implement that? Well, I would learn theoretical things, right? And then I would put them into practice and see if they worked or if they didn't work. And if they worked, I kept them. If they didn't work, I'd eliminate them. And uh, I was very good at getting feedback from my body. And I noticed earlier on, if I'd exceeded a certain amount in the gym, uh, time in the gym or sets and reps or whatever, volume in the gym, I kind of stopped growing, came to a halt. And um, if I took a week off and came back, people come to me all the time, I just took a week off from the gym and I come back and now I'm better, I'm stronger. I'm not, not surprised, mate, because you were just overtrained and you needed to let your body rest and recover and then it can overcompensate and grow. So that shows you you were overtraining. Um, so very early on I recognised this and I think the amount of exercise you need to do for muscle growth, or even for cardiovascular fitness as well now, the evidence is pointing, is very, very little. You've just got to do it to the point of exhaustion to get an adaptation. And you were one of the first people to use HIT training. Well, uh, high intensity training originates with the teachings of Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones was a guy who was passionate about bodybuilding, and he was a billionaire from related other, other industries. He had no interest in making any money from bodybuilding. He just wanted to get the facts out there. Arthur Jones, who built the Nautilus machines, we've got a couple of them in here. So Arthur Jones pointed out, he wasn't right about everything, but he was the first guy to point out that intensity of exercise, muscular effort, is the key to triggering growth. And he was the first guy to point out genetics as well. Before that, we were being sold the dream. Like, everyone can be like Arnold. You just train like Arnold and take this protein. and this, Everyone can be like that. No, everyone can't be like that. You know, uh, your ultimate development of muscle is limited by genetic factors. If you want to be a successful bodybuilder, you need certain physical traits. Just like if you want to be a football player, a basketball player, or whatever, you're not going to be a basketball player if you're five foot tall. If you want to be a bodybuilder, you need to be naturally lean, you need long muscle bellies, you need a proportionate skeletal structure, so on and so on. You know? And he pointed all this out, where before nobody re realised this. And it's accepted now, everyone knows it. But he's the guy that pointed that out. And then Mike Mensa kind of took Arthur Jones' principles and made them more commercial and uh, sold them to the main uh, bodybuilding audience because he was... Mr. America, Mr. Universe, and competing in Mr. Olympia. And, and Mike was very articulate and very uh, logical in his writings and everything, and that had a big effect on me. And when I trained, then, you know, uh, if I did more, progress stopped. If I did less, it started again. So it was, it was pretty easy for me to work out. And it just ref I just refined it a little bit over the years, but pretty much I basically trained the same. And one thing people need to realize is when you first start training, you can't generate that much intensity, that 
much stress on your system, on your nervous system and so on. So you can get away with doing more, almost overtraining and still progress. As you get bigger and stronger, <coughs> the chances that you're going to overtrain are greater because you're exerting that much force on your system. For instance, you start training, you squat 100 pounds, later, years later you're doing 400 pounds, your legs have got bigger and they can lift that weight, but your nervous system is the same nervous system that you had when you were lifting 100 pounds, it's now under four times as much stress, theoretically. So as you get bigger and stronger, you need to cut back a little bit in your volume. So, and all these things flew in the face of what everyone was being taught. Um, but because I won the Mr. Olympia, people started listening to me. But if I take a step backwards, so you, yeah. you've won the, uh, the Mr. Birmingham. Won the Mr. Birmingham. I went to do the novice uh, in Morecambe. And I remember going there, you know, I did my proper preparation. And at this point, I was, I was looking really good, but I hadn't competed before. And I hadn't stood next to somebody on stage before. And now I can see that I really did underestimate myself. I went there thinking, it would be nice to win this one. And I reckon I'm, I look good enough to win a novice contest. Well, let's see how it goes. That was me going in there, yeah? And I remember pumping up backstage, and there's a couple of lads. He looks good. He looks good. Huh? Okay. I'm in with a chance, though. I'm in with a chance. Gone up on stage, done the compulsories. Came back off stage. Uh, was Ron Davis there, who was the head of the Edinburgh Federation at the time. There were several other judges. And they're like, where did you come from? What are you doing in the novice class? I'm like, because I'm a novice, it's my first contest. And no, 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 you should be in the heavyweights. No, but I'm not good, to be, not good enough to be in the heavyweights. I wanted to do the novice first, maybe later when I'm bigger. And Listen, joker, not good enough to be in the heavyweights. Listen, son, you're better than all our heavyweights that we've got. You're the best heavyweight in the country, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, really? Yes, and we want you to compete in the World Games next weekend which is a world championship, as our heavyweight representative, we want you to come and try out. So Ron Davis, he had a gym in Her Street in Birmingham called Muscle Machine. They, they opened up, it was kind of bodybuilding uh, gym, but very nice and you know, a bit fancy. Um, so he held the trials, they were going to be held there to see who the team would be, you know. And uh, so at this time I'd left the industrial cleaning job and I was just doing some security work, like door work, a couple of nights on a wine bar for a friend of mine, and uh, I did security for a clothes shop in town to discourage shoplifting. So it was just enough for me to get by and train and, and eat and everything. So every last penny had gone into this contest, new tracksuit, haircut, spray tan. Yeah, it was all the money I had, I was broke. But boom, I got into the contest and I won it. And then they're like, why don't you come? My concern was, how the bloody are going to afford this? I can't say to these people, yeah, I'll come if you give me a couple hundred quid, mate, because I've got no money for food or anything this week now. I couldn't really do that, right? So I had to borrow some money off my uh, brother-in-law for a bit of food and bus fare and this and that, and got myself to the gym. Not ideal circumstances to be going to like, try out for the British team, but that, that's what it was. And I got there, and the top British bodybuilders were there at the time. And these are people I looked up to, Angelito Lester, Martin Alamango, um, some other guys. Uh, Richard Farmer was there, who was top uh, bodybuilder I became friends with eventually. So I went there, feeling a bit out of place. And these guys all know each other. It's like a bit clicky, and I went there, and I was like, okay, and I'll, I better warm up then. So I'm doing some warm up, doing some brent press. And Richard Farmer came and stood behind me. All right, kid. Yeah, all right, Rich. He's like, listen, yeah, better than all these fucking wankers in here. Telling you, mate, you've got to believe it, you're betting all these wankers. Oh, thanks, Rich. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I got shows for the, the British team to go to the World Games. And uh, Ron Davis was head of the EFBB, so head of the English Federation. But he was also highly placed in the IFBB as well. He was an international judge. So he used to judge at the Mr. Olympian professional contest. So he knew all these people. And he sat me down and was like, listen, you don't realise how good you are. You're going to go to the yeah, I'm going to the World Games, mate. I'm competing against Barry DeMay and Matt Mendon. and all these guys were like superstars to me. Like they've been, you know. Um, Selwyn Cottrell was the the other British heavyweight. So the two of us got chosen. Uh, it was being held in Wembley. So I went down to Wembley, 
And this was all going against my grain because I hadn't prepared for it properly. I'm very, you know, I like to prepare for things, I like to plan for things. And this was, boom, I got dropped in the deep end. And I felt like really out of place there because all these people knew each other, I didn't know them, and there's, these guys are stars, and it's just me coming along, I don't know anybody. So I remember feeling a bit uncomfortable. And then um, Ron Davis asked me if I'd go to the opening ceremony and represent bodybuilding, because they had opening ceremony, and these guys from bodybuilding, and these guys from water skiing, and weightlifting, and whatever, all these different sports that were there. World Games is kind of like Olympic Games, but it's sports that are not yet in the Olympics. So that's what it was, there were a lot of sports there. So myself and Della Shahabi, who was a female competitor at the time, we were the bodybuilding representatives, and because we went with just a track top, and I had, I had no, you know, I had my legs out, no bottoms. Obviously, that's visually exciting for the camera. So all the TV cameras came over. So then I got on TV, you know, and people that knew me and everything saw me on TV. But the other lads were not too happy. Angelita Lester, I'm not, you know, the English team were not too happy because who's this kid just come from nowhere and like he's now on the, t he's like who is this, you know? And, they, and I think somebody said something to me like, listen, you know, I'm like, listen, guys. I respect all of you, you know, I look up to you and everything, you know? But Ron Davis brought me here in his car and he put me there and he said, you do this. So, you know, what I'm going to do, I've done it, yeah. But, um, so, you know, we smoothed all that over and everything. But I just, from their point of view, I was an outsider coming in and getting the limelight. Um, I competed in the contest and I got seventh place out of 13 competitors. I didn't look as good as I did the week before when I won my contest because I, Honestly, didn't have enough money to even eat properly and the stress of going into this, you know, whole situation and everything. But I did seventh place out of 13 competitors and it's a world championship. These guys have all been training for like five or six years minimum. I've been training for a year and a half. So even though I was kind of disappointed because it wasn't a win, um, I suppose it showed me, look, you know, the winner was Barry DeMay who went on to be pro and Matt Mendenhall is a big star. Um, not too bad if I got seventh place in a world championship after 18 months. So then I set my target on becoming British champion. And that was, so the, the World Games was 1985? 85, yeah. So you would have been 23? I was 23 years old, yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously you said that it was very tough for you financially. You were putting all your money into food yeah. and living expenses. What happened after the World Games then? Um, after the World Games, because of that I was in the World Games and it was on TV and people see me, I started to get a little bit of recognition and um, from the contest the week before and everything. Um, on the British scene, everyone was like, you know, knew I had arrived. Um, so I wanted to compete in the uh, British Championships the next year, 86. And this time, you know, as a fully fledged heavyweight. So my plans have been novice British champion, like, forget about that, mate, just, you know, just go into the heavyweights. So that's what I did. In 1986, I went into the heavyweights, um, made a couple of mistakes. One of them was my hairstyle. Uh, the other one was dieting too What's much. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a funny story, because uh, I went to the, you know, it was all the rage at the time to have highlights, right? Blonde highlights. So I thought, that would look cool with a tan and everything. <laughs> But I don't think the guy knew I wanted highlights and thinks I just want my hair bleached like a light bulb, you know? <laughs> so that's what happened. I just had totally white hair and it's a week before a contest, nothing I can do about it, right? I remember coming down here and me and Martin, because he had the gym at the time, we have a laugh about it now. He said, I remember you coming down them stairs and saying to me, does it look bad? Does it, does it look all right? And I was like, yeah, it looks all right. <laughs> like, what could I say, you know? Anyway, it was that and... Uh, I think, you know, it was the British Championship, and I thought, well, I've got to diet more and then get more ripped and everything that, than I did before, but because I'm naturally lean, I, I was already ripped in my first contest, so what happened, I just got more dehydrated and, and a little bit flatter and smaller, and I got very bad, bad cramps on stage, so lessons learned. Anyway, I won the uh, heavyweight class, and I built, beat Selwyn Cottrell, who I think he got sixth place in the World Games, so I beat him, and then there was, at those, in those days, there was four weight classes, four winners, and then you'd have a contest between the four winners to have an overall British champion, and the overall British champion then would get his pro card, yeah? So there was me and three other weight class winners to pose down for the British championship, and the judges awarded it to the light heavyweight winner, whose name was Chris Oskies, 
Um, and I just got to say, it was a really bad decision. It's the only one I've had, but it was a really bad decision. Uh, <clears throat> I was a Birmingham lad. I'm not the kind of guy that wants to get in with people and, and I just call it kissing ass. I don't do it. I just do my own thing. I don't want to upset anybody, but I won't go out of my way to try and, you know, mm. friend you or get any favours out of anything. It's just not the way I do things. And uh, most of the, the, I think the Federation and the judges were from London. Chris was from London. I was not Mr. Nice Guy. And uh, so he got the overall. Probably a good thing for me because if I'd won the overall at that point and got my pro card, maybe it would have been a bit premature. I was not really ready, you know. Um, anyway, so I was heavyweight British champion in 1986. 1987, um, I was actually a, uh, an after effect of being in the World Games and everything. Um, I had a doctor because, yes, I was using steroids, obviously, for these contests. And I had a doctor who was very, uh, very helpful in doing my blood tests and monitoring and everything. He was interested in what I was doing. And uh, he's just like, these gyms are becoming big business, eh? I'm like, yeah, they are. So he said, how about me and you open a gym? I'll put up the money. You run the gym. And we'll split the profits 50-50. And the only reason I'm saying this to you it's because I know you're an honest person. All right, thanks. So I go about looking for a gym premises. Martin had left this place, so this place was empty. So I went to a guy called Mike Haig, who's owned the lease on this building since the 60s, and he had some kind of gym here, and then the Kung Fu, and then leased it to Martin. Anyway, Mike still had the lease, and I knew Mike from when I was at school. Mike was running the gym and the Kung Fu center and everything. So I went to Mike and said, listen, I want to rent the building up here. Why? because I want to open a gym. Yeah, but you, you ain't got no money. Why are you going to do that? So all well, this guy, you know, I explained the story to him. And he's like, all right. So let me tell you something. He said, I've been in business many years. He said, I've been rocked off countless times. But I can tell you something. You will never steal from me. Because I can see it in your eyes. He said, so I'll put the money up for the gym. I'll do exactly the same deal. I'll buy all the equipment that you want, make the gym, you run the gym, we pay the bills, we split the profit. So that's how it started. And uh, I came down here with a couple of lads and we did all the work ourselves. We knocked down walls with a Kango hammer. We had a skip outside, carting up the bricks and everything, well, painting the walls. And while that was going on, I was training at the Forum in Chelmsley Wood. Um, and there I met Bill Kazmaier. And Bill Kazmaier was like, he was really taken aback at how heavy I was training. Because I just thought that was normal. I thought everyone trained like that. You know, I read the magazines and these, you know, these guys say they do this and do this, and I believe them. So I'm doing it, yeah? And he's like, hey man, you're fucking strong for a bodybuilder. I'm like, well, oh, not that strong, really. He said, no, man. He said, no bodybuilders in America ain't doing that. And so Bill was very encouraging. It was nice to meet him. He was, uh, I remember watching him as Str World's Strongest Man when I was at school. And, uh, you know, he had a great physique for a, for a strong man as well. So it was great to meet Bill, and uh, the Forum was a good gym for you know a lot of world-class powerlifting and strong one there. So it was interesting training there for a bit while I got this place ship shape, uh, 87, opened this up, and then um, then I had a decent income coming in from the gym because there were not that many gyms around in those days. It wasn't that competitive, so the place was packed out, you know. So we're making uh, decent money there, which allowed me you know to concentrate more on my training and not worry financially. Um, you know, I had a child when I was 20 years old, so I was Lewis, who's here now, he's 30 years old, so I was also doing my best to support him and, and his mum while I was doing all this. And when the gym came along, then the pressure was off because mm -hmm. we had a, you know, not great, but a decent income, enough to pay for the family and for me to train and uh, eventually get that car, you know. So you got two offers of people who were, were going to back you. And they both instinctively knew that I was very honest, and they were right. I never would steal a penny from anybody. So how would you it's describe yourself? How would I describe myself? Um, I don't know. I think uh, I'm blindly honest. I don't have the, you know, I don't have it in me to try and bullshit. Sometimes I'm too honest, and maybe brutally so to people. But you know, that's that's the way it is. Um, and I think. Uh, I'm beyond determined if I want to do something. And life's made me like that, you know? As I said, if, if I'd have come from a, com 
conventional family, comfortable background, no, you know, maybe I wouldn't be the person I am because I wouldn't need to be the person I am. I mm -hmm. could be, you know, more relaxed, but I couldn't afford to be like that when I was young and that, you know, that makes you strong. And, uh, you know, when you were getting, working towards your pro card, uh, it sounds like a lot of the time you were not that confident. Um, well, did I go around saying I'm going to be Mr. Olympia? Absolutely not. Even if I thought it in the back of my mind, I would never say that to anybody because it was just too far off. I like to do one thing at a time, you know, realism. Uh, you know, if you're a novice competitor and you just think, I'm going to be Mr. Olympia, I want to be Mr. Olympia, that's just an unrealistic, like, way in the future, yeah? Maybe it's a good goal, but right now it's not realistic. So, first step is I need to be overall British champion. Yeah, and I need to do that in style. If I can't murder the British amateurs, I've got no chance in a professional because it's such a big jump from being a good, a good amateur to being a good professional. Even a great amateur to being a great professional is very difficult. Most people don't make it, you know? So I wanted to be realistic. And uh, as I said, it was good that I didn't win in 86. So 87 was building the gym. 88, gym's running, making money training for a British Championship, uh, this time with experience, didn't over diet, didn't do things wrong. Uh, British Champion, I think it was probably the easiest decision they've had to make at that contest. Uh, it was outright heavyweight and overall winner and the pro card, you know? Yeah. So well, now I'm on the way, I'm on the way. It's been a fantastic story to get to that pro card. Yeah, um, to get to that pro card and, uh, and then, being honest with myself, I'm not really sure if I told anybody this, but I definitely made this vow to myself at this point. Because the gym's going well, right? I could open more gyms, but that is going to take my dedication away from competing. So that's one option. The other option is I'm going to be a sex sexful, successful professional. And either way, bodybuilding has changed my life and for the better, and I'm making my living from it. I'm independent. Uh, man, which is important to me. Um, so, 88 won the British. Right, pro now. You're going to go pro. I didn't want to rush into it because I wanted to give my best shot. So, I chose Knight of Champions, which is 1990. So, that was about, about 16 months after the British win. Um, and I said to myself, right, realistically, let's look at the history of bodybuilding. If you're going to be a champion bodybuilder, a professional bodybuilder, look at the history. Lee Haney, 24, straight in, winning. Everyone, you know, if you're going to be a Mr. Olympia, you don't go into a professional contest and get 15th place and then next year be Mr. Olympia. You might go and get second or something and then be Mr. Olympia. The only one that has broken that rule is Ronnie because Ronnie came along and he didn't hit it straight away for various reasons. He hit it later on. Um, so he was around for a few years, but before that, you know, if you've got it, you've got it, basically. That's what I'm saying. So I wanted to see if I got it. So I said, I'm going to do Night of Champions. I'm going to get everything into this contest. And if I do not place in the top five, that's it for me. Competitive bodybuilding, finish. Realistically, I haven't got it what it takes. So why am I making sacrifices? Why am I asking my family to make sacrifices if I'm just pursuing a foolish dream that's not going to come to anything, which I've seen countless people doing countless people neglecting their family, neglecting everything, because they thought they were going to be a bodybuilder there and won the British yet, you know? And yet they're living this lifestyle. So if I didn't get in the top five, I would have continued in bodybuilding, but I probably would have put my efforts and time into opening more gyms or something, something else like that. When you say um, uh, you... Um, would I mean, you're obviously very, very dedicated. What, what sort of sacrifice did you make with the family? Ah, just time and energy, really. You got no, you know, your time and energy is limited. And if you're on a diet and you're just trying to concentrate and putting one foot in front of the other without falling over, because you've just trained, you know, that day and you've done cardio twice and you've done your posing, you know, I barely got my energy to speak, let alone go to my kids' sports day or, you know, something that they might need. So it's time and energy, really. Not, you know, not financially, it's, it's just, it's time and effort that you need. Uh, it's all-consuming, the sport, you know? 
I never went to bed after 11.30. Yeah, I, I never drank alcohol. That. Everything was regimented towards me achieving my goal. Are there any regrets about that? No, there's no regrets about it because it actually worked out for me and I was able to change my family's destiny from living in a council flat in Ladywood to living in a nice house in Sutton Coalfield and going my kid going to better school and all everything going on holiday, all the things that come with it. So, no, I don't have any regrets on that point. And uh, you're obviously absolutely dedicated towards achieving your aim. Absolutely, mate. I would have eaten through my leg if, it, if, if I had to. That wouldn't have helped. No, it wouldn't have helped, but <laughs> just to try and <laughs> illustrate, you know. If somebody said to me, Dorian, you've got to starve yourself for two weeks and eat nothing to achieve this. If I thought that goal was worth it at the end, I'm, no doubt I will do that. I will mm. starve for two weeks. I'll do whatever. If the goal at the end is just a decision. It takes this to get there, and that's what you got at the end. Is it worth putting this in? Yes or no? If it's yes, get on with it. If it's no, forget about it. Mm. It's pretty simple. But just finally, Dorian, um, is there advice that you can give to people, um, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that are inspired by you? Uh, you know, I wanted to do this particular interview to look at those early years to show how dedicated and how hard it was for Well, you. I think people can just take inspiration from the story you know, because I didn't have any advantages there. Whatever advantages you can call, I didn't have them. I didn't have a family. I didn't have anybody supporting me. I didn't even have anybody saying, yeah, this is a good idea, like you're doing. Nobody was interested until I won that first contest and everyone was like, wow, who is this guy? He's going to be a star. And then people get on board and want to help you, yeah? Mm. So in the end, it's, it's up to you. And... Uh, the biggest thing that I say in life is life is going to knock you down on your ass and you have to get up and it might knock you down again and you have to get up. If you want to sit down when you get knocked down, that's where you're going to stay. You just need to keep getting back up, that's it. Yeah. Well, Dorian, thank you very much. It's been Thanks. very interesting. Thanks, guys.